in the last decade mental health is probably the most underrated yet most rampant epidemic as per numbers two thirds of indian women today struggle and suffer from mental health what's depressing quite literally is women reluctant to come and speak about it perhaps because of the stigma and the judgment associated with mental health struggles hi everyone this is akshita on today's episode of nari speak up we we're decoding mental health its impact on women also its impact on workplace five very interesting women from different walks of life mandeen who is an author um akshita pande a, a counseling psychologist tanaz cardos founder kind hearts brigade dr prajakta patkar consultant psychologist and finally nidhi co-founder nia wellbeing an enterprise that works towards creating a healthier and happier workplace so ladies thank you so much for joining me today what i'd like to first do is talk to somebody who's very generously agreed to contribute personal stories of mental health struggles mandeen i know you mentioned that you have um, you know faced issues so i think it would be great if you can share um certain stories of your uh, journey with mental health and i'm sure everyone uh, would be able to relate yeah so over to you in my journey with mental health actually started not with my own it started with my dad so my dad was suffering from depression he was suffering from clinical depression and uh, his whole personality changed he is like totally outgoing person and we are like uh, two daughters but he will like sit with our friends our girlfriends and you know just talk like that and he he was like the most extrovert person that i knew growing up right and uh, as he entered into his late 60s early 70s uh, this depression thing came in and i just couldn't understand like why my father has changed so much and to be honest i was quite brash and rude about it when it was my father who was going through it i was like jao na therapist ke paas how does it matter go go i was just pushing him i was not listening to him i was just pushing him anyway so like a lot of family uh, came together and my dad is now uh, on uh, you know he is seeking therapy as well as a psychiatrist self and he's on a uh, medicine and he's uh, pretty smooth there are no more ebbs and flows how does a person look like the person who is suffering from depression anxiety or any other kind of uh, mental health issues they look just like us like we don't have like extra horns or anything that we look different or like you know just like everybody is living their life and they have some parts that you don't know about it's just like that and uh, my uh, depression basically got diagnosed because i had a um uh, i had a dnc which is basically a procedure for miscarriage like in uh, 2020 uh, while uh, in pandemic so i uh, conceived and then i had a miscarriage and after the procedure my gynae suggested you know you should go for therapy and i was like what why all that anyways i talked to the therapist like i just had a call with her and like she told me something about postpartum depression and i was like because uh, according to my therapist like this thing was ongoing for like 3 4 years and like you know the feeling of negativity the feeling of i'm a loser i am better dead than alive for everybody uh, in the world i know like i'm i am laughing when i'm saying this but like at that time it was like very real like every time when i wake up the first thought in my mind was oh shit aaj nahi mari oh shit aaj jeena padega and that is it it's a disease and to be honest i was one of those people who used to say are ye mental mental health kuch nahi hota will power ki baat hoti hai hmm and literally about like 6 months back i went to my psychiatrist because i had a relapse of clinical depression and i literally cried in front of her and i said main to brave ladki hu i am brave like how can i you know have depression like i am telling you this journey has been going for like 2 3 years right now it started in pandemic and still like i am not able to i would say uh, believe that you know i have this thing because the outer 
you know voices that say are you know you are weak if you are going to therapist or something of that sort whereas i believe like the toughest thing and i said that in very beginning only the toughest and the most brave thing that anybody can do is when they require not like aise hi uthke chale jao but when they require go to a therapist go to a psychiatrist because it's just like a broken arm or a broken leg right but dikhta nahi hai bahar se right right so i think uh, thank you so much for sharing your story i'm sure it wasn't very easy i think a few points that you touched upon um you know which to sort of bring me to my um, next part of my conversation i think one thing that you spoke about that people saying are you don't look like somebody who's depressed right i think this is something which a lot of people um w- would say and and i think this that certain conditions which unfortunately um are prevalent in women right so for example mm-hmm. postpartum depression is something where finally perhaps getting ourselves to talk about today i think the conversation is a lot more mainstream than it was a decade yes. ago so i think next i i would like to talk to professionals in this space and today we have not one but two of them we have akshita who's a uh, who's a counseling psychologist and uh, dr prajakta patkar who is a consultant psychiatrist so you know as as the professionals who have been practicing in this space for a while now i'd really like to open out the floor to you and to understand why are certain conditions more prevalent in women um not just women specific conditions but mental health conditions in general also what is it that you see with women being reluctant to talk about mental health and i think just trying to understand the equation as to why um why the numbers show more women being affected with mental health as compared to men that the 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 disorders or uh, the prevalence is more in women honestly it's as equal in men but uh the society at least you know asian societies where we come from men are supposed to be these patriarchal people where they are supposed to hold it all together and until and unless it's like really bad and they can't just get now then they for because that's what they're supposed to do that's why you're unfortunate but uh, it's also that you know when more often than not what we see in clinics or in hospitals is that when women come to us for help in psychiatric clinics it's the the disorder is much more severe the severity is much more the depression is much more the anxiety is much more because if it's mild or moderate they just starts to deal with it you know theek ho jayega uh matlab just wait and watch let it go if a male is that okay i'm having i'm having anxiety i'm i'm, I'm feeling depressed he or she does he uh, sorry he doesn't have to think before actually approaching for help uh and he has the access also so he can just walk into a clinic while a woman come mm. so most of that women when they come to us for help they are in the severe category and you know now it's it's impossible for them to do the household chores that is when they come to us Uh, just last week i was seeing a woman who was having schizophrenia for the last 12 years but she has two two full grown sons who are going to college a, a, a husband who is going to office every day but they never bothered taking her to a psychiatrist until and unle- until she stopped working and cooking at home so uh, that's that's the unfortunate bit that we deal with Right. access to care is there but access to women care is is uh, you know falls a little behind uh, right. even in big cities like mumbai and delhi right. so hence maybe it may seem that you know uh, the, the, i mean the the cases are much more in it's just that men probably have access to care faster and sooner and no one want, no one would think twice before spending money on their medication or therapy which is if a woman is spend you know 2k or 3k in a consult or for medications it's a burden on the family i think i'm i'm really interested to hear what akshita has to contribute on on this topic so in my experience um, what i have also noticed in my practice is that men have just as much of a risk in emotional inner world as women do but women are also socially either conditioned or allowed in a way to express and feel the full range of emotion 
with men, you will see one of the things they present with the most is anger, which usually is the emotion that covers up a lot of other things that's going on. And that's almost the only emotion they're allowed or conditioned to express. With women, there is this whole conditioning of being that self-sacrificing motherly image who is just contributing, contributing, giving, whether it's at the workplace or at home and never taking care of themselves, basically. There's been generations of women that have come before us who've not even considered that taking care of yourself is something you can do. So here, why conditioning is something I speak of is because when we see, when we look beyond the gender binary and we see people assigned male at birth who present in a more feminine way growing up, they also experience and express the range of emotions that we would see typically cisgender women um, being able to express. So for me, I think a lot of this is to do with conditioning and how much the spaces that you're in allow you to express and feel. When Tragicta said the severity is seen more in women, that is something that I would agree with. But I also have a feeling that is because it's ignored for very long. It's, it's something they just continuously, women tend to suppress and not let out again to follow that self-sacrificing narrative that we're conditioned to have. They wait till it comes to a point of no return at, at which point they have no other option but to seek help, right? If they don't do it, then it's the family. And I think what Prajakta said really sort of echoes in my mind is that a lot of times it's only because the only time they start feeling that she, she might have an issue is when they realize that their lives are getting affected because of her mm -hmm. inability to, you know, to, to, to do what is expected of her. Right. So I think what I'm also trying to understand, maybe do a little deep dive on is that, is this the conditioning, you know, whether we've always been raised to, you know, to be, to be the epitome of, uh, of tolerance of the, be the epitome of strength. And they're supposed to be tolerant, much more tolerant, but it's also like Akshata said, you know, that it's, it's many times it's, it's just named on the sex that, oh, she's, you know, she's anxious because she's a woman or it's anxiety provoking for her because she's a woman and you know it's just it's just how women are but if say, there's someone who's saying that okay i am not doing that great it doesn't always have to be because of my sex and it also doesn't have to be related to hormones but i can't be pmsing all all 30 days of the month and i can't be hormonal all 30 days of the month. but it's so blatantly uttered at workplace at uh, among friends and you know at home wherever but it's just that uh there there also i also feel that society based in a way that if i'm also taking if i need help i am groomed in a way as a woman to okay i should probably approach for help if it's in if i do it anymore so it's also upon the woman that if I need help, I have to pick myself up and ask for it. Right. And that's how it should go from right from school to ahead. That if mm -hmm. I need help, I have to pick up my hand and ask. For it. But that's not how Indian women, girls, you know, adolescents are raised. So there are times when mothers are getting their children who are suffering from mental illnesses to to the clinic and they themselves are so burnt out but they don't ask for help they're asking for their child they're asking for their alcoholic husband they're asking help for uh, you know their in-laws but that's the least the last thought that comes to their mind is asking help for myself hmm. and that is a narrative which we need to change among society which is an although we keep harping about it but Right. I think again, what you what is what we said, right? Women always being raised to put everybody ab in, uh, before themselves and in, in, include, um, sorry, everyone before themselves except themselves, right? So, yeah. So I think here I'd also like to bring in um, uh, about your experience of working in this space and what you've seen. Um, thanks, Akshita. 
uh, building on the points that you were mentioning and Prajakta also mentioned about how women are uh, groomed from the very childhood to be the you know epitome of like uh, patience and tolerance and all that. I think one of the things, especially for anxiety, like I've talked to my friends and this is coming from my personal experience and my friend's personal experience, uh, that we often ignore the socio-cultural norms when we are talking about anxiety and stuff. I'll just give an example. Uh, for example, like if I have to venture out uh, at night, I will obviously very anxious and I will be all like, you know, this is not normal and char lo kya kahenge. And this has happened with me, like, even when I'm returning late, like, people are looking at me with weird eyes. And a friend of mine who is suffering from a debilitating anxiety, uh, she moved to Europe, she went to Netherlands, and, like, at 12 a.m. in the night, she was, like, biking and she called me. She was on the uh, bicycle. And, like, she was so free. And, like, I was like, oh, I, I, I was surprised that she is the most anxious person. How is like she so chill that she's driving a bicycle? And then, you know, the things that she told me, like, you know, bicycles have separate lanes. So definitely a car can't run you over. Every 10 meters, there's a street light. So you know that nothing will happen. There are CCTV cameras. And in general, the society itself is not like that, that, oh, a Kaylee Ladki and you start catcalling or, you know, or do all that thing. I think a lot of factors in India, which are like socio-cultural factors, also add upon to the baggage of women. That's yes. all I wanted to contribute. Yes, Thanks. Yes. No, absolutely. I think, and I think that's uh, that's that that's one thing which I which I think we hadn't thought about is that a lot of times when we think of socio-cultural norms, they are to do with patriarchy and and what is expected out of women in families. But I think what you also touched upon is. Um, even certain things as women's safety, right? Like that also becomes such a major stress point, um, which eventually accumulates and leads to, you know, issues in your overall health. Uh, so yeah, so I think now I want to talk to Tanas because, you know, you're also running an organization and I'm sure you work with a lot of people also. And I just, again, I want to hear a little bit about um, the, the equation between women and mental health. Um, yeah, over to you. All right. So um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Is basically, I try to make kindness more accessible because I feel like there's this huge notion about what kindness should be. And it, it gets very overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to also make just wellness more accessible to people because there are times where people, um, you know, whether the companies are not providing them with simple health care or, um, you know, they feel like therapy is too expensive and not that I claim that I'm offering any sort of therapy, but um, I think the sim like the the most important thing to do and the most important thing that people like choose not to do is self-care you know a lot of like a lot of things that were mentioned people put other people before they put themselves and um, a lot of that again has to do with uh, patriarchy and things like that I run like a sort of support group which is basically where people come together and because it's a very uh it's not an intimidating space. I give people five minutes to speak about what they want to speak about. And, um, you know, like a very, so it's funny because a very overarching theme is always patriarchy. You know, people are sad at home. They are sad that they can't take, they feel like they can't take care of their kids. They feel like they're in, um, you know, they have issues with in-laws and things like that. And I think a lot of, uh, these people need a space to vent, but they don't have the opportunity or they don't have the options to do that. So with my work, it's mostly about just making self-kindness more accessible or just kindness more accessible through like workshops and products and this. But I've seen a lot of, um, you know, women specifically where uh, like they would come like they would come to a group that I'm holding and they would they wouldn't know what it's about so they would say like it's some sort of self-care thing okay let me check it out but as soon as they're in a safe space where they can talk about whatever so the cameras are off um you know no one knows each other and in that sort of space there, there's a lot of uh they finally feel like they can be themselves because there's no repercussions right there's no one judging them there's no one there to uh you know tell them tell on them and they're very free. And I've realized that a lot of women, there's so much baggage, um, you know, whether it's uh, like if some there was someone that moved to a new city and, uh, you know, she 
and because it was a very big deal for her she couldn't complain about it you know like something bad was happening with her roommate but she couldn't complain about it because what would she do she would go back to her home where her parents would taunt her for leaving you know that wasn't an option for her and there's so many um, like you, you i mean sometimes i i realize that when you sit to listen to people like both men and women but when you sit to listen to people you you just hear so many stories that are so shocking and you kind of wonder who is allowing this to happen you know why why are i've spoken to like a couple of men who uh, you know who like flowers and they don't receive flowers because it's been told that it's not manly of them or you know i've had like a colleague in office who liked a teddy bear but he said but he very quickly said that oh i can't buy a teddy bear because it's it's not a male thing to do and you know who was setting these standards and it's really i think it's so un- like this whole thing is so unfair on men and it's so unfair on, on women because this just these standards that no one really likes but you know it it's very it's becoming very difficult to kind of address it and change it and hopefully we are seeing things i think when people try to when people go to therapy and people have a uh, more the when therapy gets more accessible hopefully in the future people will realize that you know these things that they are going through right now is very unfair like i think um and i hope that the woman that you know had to wait 12 years to realize that she had schizophrenia but she didn't have the option we i hope that was like a light bulb moment that so that when anyone else around her showed even the slightest symptom she could kind of pick on that and be like hey something doesn't seem right do you want to get that checked out because um you know like even from personal experience like having like i have i do have generalized anxiety disorder and for me for my like for even my family to know that it was very it came from a place of shame like they like i'm not ashamed of it but um you know they were ashamed of me for it but uh, you know i i think a lot of it like rightly said that it it is a lot to do with like a society and like social cultural norms and um yeah i'm just hoping that it kind of changes in the future right conditioning you know which i think is actually a root cause of so many things because you you know you it's people getting upset only because they're not being able to adhere to predefined standards right so um yeah so i think what i want to really maybe you know since you know the, you deal with people um facing these issues in daily life i think just maybe want to hear a little bit about how do you encourage people to make an investment in their own health right because again something like mental health is like physical health it is a long term um investment right? i think i mean initially what i all, like cuz i normally get a lot of messages from maybe, like maybe students on that on that category who can't they don't really have the money for it and i i always recommend them to join support groups because that you know a lot of people run support groups that are either free or they charge very minimal and i think when you join support groups that are specific maybe they could be general or they specific to what you are going through so there are a lot of queer support groups there are a lot of eating disorder support groups a lot of these exist so the first step is to kind of step into that space and just hear people out and hear what other people are going through and i think after that once you're a bit more comfortable and once um you know because i think like there are a lot of therapists like i'm i'm sure akshita and prajakta can say more on this but a lot of therapists also offer their services on a sliding scale so i think th- Uh, reaching out to therapists like that really help you know i think it's it's a wonderful idea to encourage people who are hesitant to first approach support groups uh either at workplace or at schools because as as far as laws goes now everyone needs to have an in house counselor let it be at school let it be at workplace let it be in hospitals anywhere uh so yeah support groups are a very good idea to maybe break that uh barrier which they are facing uh and maybe once they see okay this is not as difficult as it seems speaking out about mental health for most is difficult because they've never done it before they it's never encouraged at home so uh you know it's it's just that initial barrier which we need to break and then you know go ahead uh, it, it might be easier uh the second thing i would want to uh, emphasize on so i work in a public hospital as as well as i have my own private practice but you know the um 
the kind of uh, hesitancy is equal with both strata of society. So right. even if when people come to my clinic where they are going to shell out some money, versus when people are going to come to me in the hospital, which is free of cost, the hesitancy is the same. And the hesitancy is the same because we are not encouraged to do that since childhood. We are not, this is not, so if I'm having pain in my tummy, my mom is going to take me to the doctor. But if I am not sleeping well, or if I'm feeling, you know, I, I, I'm feeling sad or upset, my mom or my dad are not going to take me to the doctor. Because that's not what I am going to speak out aloud about it, that, okay, mom, I'm not, or dad, I'm not feeling all that well inside me, as in not in a, in a particular part, but just in my mind, I'm not feeling well. So if we need to do that. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Definitely on the topic of accessibility, there are plenty of options. There's the sliding scale option. There are young therapists that offer, um, early career therapists, excuse me, not young, that offer um, pro bono sessions or support groups that are a great way to collectivize your voice to realize that there are other people that are also dealing with what you're dealing with. But however, um, coming to your first session is one step, but also sticking through it is hard. I would like to talk about when the last question we were touching upon. So the first, and I'm talking specifically to workplaces, it's not that, I mean, the biggest issue is lack of awareness and taboo, or you say stigma. So people don't want to, even if they have resources, it's not about money. Someone else is paying for them. You have the resources. Still, people are not going because they have a lot of stigma and they have issues about confidential. Hmm. So every time we go, we do, a, you know, a, like initiation call wherein we talk about how the product, product will roll out, how the services look like, what you have to do. So the biggest question is, is it confidential? Right. The organization will not get to know about it. So first thing, they don't know that they need the help because there's no absolutely lack of awareness that what a mental health condition looks like. So you have to talk about that. And then you have to you know, assure them that it's very confidential. So these are the two issues when we talk about mental health support in the workplaces that come up. Not talking about specifically for women. So I would say that Yes, organizations are doing, they are taking steps wherein, you know, they are realizing that there are specific issues uh, which women go through, like uh, I would say as caregivers or sandwich parents, those who have, you know, they have to take care of uh, elderly in family, they have to take care of young children, and they are also working, so they are doing so much, and the biggest burden lies on the women. So, you know, they're caregivers. So how we can provide them flexibility, more flexibility in terms of when they want to choose from where they want to work, I mean, from where they want to work, when they want to work. So those kind of things. And specifically, like there can be self-care days or mental health care days. Also, they are allowing in addition to, you know, period leaves or, uh, you know, maternity leaves benefits they get. But still, again, I say that people, though I know the organization is offering, uh, still women are struggling with this issue, whether I should take this leave, whether I should say that, you know, I need this period leave or I, you know, I need this. Will mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, put me in a, a difficult position as an employee? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that has to change. That still has to change. Mm -hmm. So organizations are doing, they are aware of and they are offering. Some of them are surely offering support, like we talk about PTSD. So offering support for them. Or, you know, mid-career support, like, you know, when, uh, you know, uh, like uh, menopause. So, you know, that, at that stage also, they go through a lot and they may need support. So organizations are realizing and they want to offer help. The biggest issue is that how do we kind of take away that, you know, issue where I don't want to talk about it. I feel that my career progression will be basically basis this, maybe it can be hampered. So that needs to be talked about a lot. And uh, if we talk about, men, you know, mental health in the workplaces, so awareness, a lot of awareness, and also at the supervisor levels or managerial level, we have to bring in that, you know, we have to give that training that they know that how they should identify if someone in their team is mm -hmm. going through something and what should they be doing? How should they be talking? Because generally what happens when you go to someone and say that, you know, I am burned out, you know, I, I am just going through a lot. 
and your manager or i mean your peers tell you that okay you just don't think about it you're thinking too much about it just don't think about it everything will be fine and that's the worst thing you can tell someone you are invalidating their experience you are invalidating what they are going through so the big thing is that how do we kind of bring this awareness how do we provide this training so that's what i think that you have to work on different levels and it's not just for women for everyone you know so i think maybe what you're saying and i think it's so uh, true that for her, what we need is more empathetic workplaces right workplaces where which understand that today if you know you're is uh, for a woman who's going through um, you know to, to menopause there is of course a physical element of what's happening but the mental side is so strong um so you know that i i just wanted to add that it, like it like even if the company do, does offer it i think there's a lot of training that needs to go to employees as well where you say that this is safe we will not come to know about it and um you know this is a resource because we believe and we believe that you do need the mental support and uh, of course there's enough research that says that companies benefit from productive employees but just yeah. from a like just being more empathetic and being empathetic leaders where you know like i say when lead if leaders recognize that their employees are you know that then the best employee is not performing their best there's certainly something that's wrong so you know if when companies have these systems in place where you know we have a uh, mental health support why don't you try out a session with a counselor i think um that sort of education from an employer is really important right exactly so tanas that's the thing that we don't have to just provide the support or resources we also have to work on training people and bring that awareness and you know tell them that it's okay go out use the support being provided to you that's very very important like i mentioned earlier accessing support is one thing but systemically being able to sustain receiving that support is a different thing so frustrations around this became very obvious post pandemic when certain changes which could have been made very easily like just switching to work from home which would allow so many more women to enter the workforce was done so easily when other people needed it done and the world demanded it and it's there are studies about how only mostly women have been affected once most companies have gone back out of work from home situations and This was actually pointed out by a client of mine who was just so frustrated. They were like, "They could do it when the world needed it, but now I have to leave my kids at home and go earlier. I could just nurse my child, take care of another thing, look after my ailing mother-in-law, and be in a meeting all at the same time, and get all three things done." Like you said, we work three shifts. So now, since post-pandemic, most offices have gone back. These frustrations are becoming around accessibility. These frustrations are becoming more clear to people. Right. Right. Okay, so I think you know, in interest of time, this almost you know brings us to um, the end of the conversation. But I think one question I really you know I'm burning to sort of ask everybody because I think one thing that each one of you have mentioned is condition, is you know somebody maybe 15 years ago, not 15, sorry, somebody a few decades ago has set certain rules which we're expected to live by, and when that right. doesn't happen, um, what comes is this feeling of self defeat. um you know what comes is this feeling of comparison obviously social media does not help either because you constantly feel you're pitted against 1 million other people who are doing so much better than you in every sphere and i think added to that is a very strong element of judgment which unfortunately seems to be a recurring theme in our society maybe more than a few others right so i think what i'm really wanting to hit at is one thing that you know we've been able to able to establish through through conversations with with each one of you is that conditioning and patriarchy or maybe even conditioning even more as a is in some way a root cause for all of this right so how do we sort of and of course if this is not something that will happen overnight a mindset takes very long to change um you know evolution takes really long so how is it that you know we can start from where we are to to break this conditioning or to you know tell people that it's okay you know you do not have to be um that this version of perfect how is it that you know we can especially if it's coming in in way of your mental health so how is it that you know we can encourage people to work themselves uh to better mental health purely by breaking um preset conditioning rules so i think that um, i mean this might be a little funny but i think the only way to counter conditioning is with conditioning so um, you know while you do have a lot of conversations about how women are supposed to be here 
if you have equal or even more conversations about how women can do anything or how therapy is good and how mental health is important uh, you know that does equal talking about it uh, right from childhood that if i have pain physically i need to talk about it kya kahan pe dard ho raha hai bataiye so similarly making it normal that if i am doing unwell mentally i need to talk about it and so say suppose uh, suppose you know i need leave today times that people don't want to tell me i'm not feeling well uh, i'm or i'm feeling unwell mentally and hence i don't need i don't want to come to work or i can't come to work but instead they end up saying oh maybe you know i have some other physical disorder hmm. if we start by saying that okay i'm not fe- i'm not feeling well mentally maybe and, and that's normal my boss shouldn't uh, frown on upon, upon it it's I, i need a day off because i'm not doing well but not physically i am well so i think normalizing talking about it right since childhood at home at workplace is like the first step right uh, and also i would like to add to that okay normalizing the talk around mental health is very important creating that awareness but also we have to look at you know as how we are bringing up our kids what kind of conditioning are we giving like why because you are a woman you have to look certain way you have to be fair or you have to be doing that or even if you are a you chose to be a career woman sole responsibility of taking or running a household lies with you why can't it be that you know the other person can your partner can take care of that if you want to do this i mean it is your choice or even if you don't want to be a career woman whatever you want to do so i mean there should be many options to be it should not be that you have to be this way so this conditioning has to go while we are talking about this normalization so that conditioning for everything has to go anyone can do anything whatever they want or they can be whichever way and this is also right that is also right so maybe we have to talk about a lot about that also the meme which said culture is nothing but peer pressure from ancestors mm-hmm. and i think that is something which is very true like especially for me when i say i spend my whole life like not whole life like i am 35 so i spend most of my life thinking uh, you know i should do you know the way my parents did it or my grandparents did it or the stories i heard about uncles and aunties doing it when i had my niece like my sister had a daughter and when i had her for the first time it was like a light bulb move- moment for me and it was like like we definitely can't change the past and we definitely can't change the elder generation but we can definitely focus on the younger generation who are like coming along and not pass on our traumas to them mm-hmm. and you know try to self feel and you know give them better guidance on how to be happy how to feel your emotions or how to deal with your emotions i think that is it for uh, uh, me thanks the conversation if somebody like uh, you know as prajakta said that if that if 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 an employee um calls up their superior and says you know i can't come today i'm just not feeling well uh that person should not have to make up an excuse that you know i'm having a headache or i'm having a backache simply because an excuse like that is more acceptable but saying that today you know i'm feeling so burnt out and i'm feeling so low that i cannot make it to work today um yeah so i think uh, you know this has been a very very interesting conversation for me um and as per our audience i'm sure they've um, experienced very different points of view but obviously i think some very strong takeaways i think from the importance of having conversation to the importance of addressing it not when um, you know not when things are so serious that there is a point of no return but when they're actually starting to brew um thirdly of course you know being more empathetic as family members as employers as employees right because at any given point so many of us are in positions of power not just power but positions where we can actually impact other people's lives and it is up it is up to us on how we use those positions well right so on this note i want to thank each each one of you uh, manbeen tanaz akshita uh, dr prajakta nidhi thank you so much for being with me today um i know you have so many better things to do on a saturday evening but just the fact that you chose to take out time for this speaks volumes um i think it was great to see how all five of you in your own way are um, contributing to a healthier uh, space for individuals as well as women and uh, i'm really hoping our audience will enjoy this conversation thank you so much